Uh, welcome everybody in uh, Ramadan Kareem. Uh, my name is Sanjay Chapla, and I'm a research director and scientist at Qatar Computing Research Institute. Uh, welcome to the first of a series of lectures on COVID-19 that the Qatar Center for AI is organizing during the next three weeks. Uh, Qatar Center for AI, or QCI for short, is the newest arm of QCRI whose aim is to bring to sharp relief our work in AI. And QCI is primarily responsible for work in our research, policy, and outreach activities associated with artificial intelligence. For example, working with the Ministry of Transportation uh, uh, and Communications, we helped bring out the National AI Strategy for Qatar in October 2009. And this study is available both in English and Arabic from our website. So this lecture series that we're organizing uh, captures a subset and a, a snapshot essentially of the work that, that engineers and scientists in QCRI are currently involved in COVID related activities. At QCRI, our expertise lies in designing computer science based models and tools. And thus it is natural that we want to direct our experience towards helping solve a crisis which has completely redefined our world. So here is uh, the outline for today. Uh, I'll uh, introduce Dr. Emil el Magamed, who's the executive director of QCRI to say a few words. After that, I'll give a brief description of all the upcoming lectures uh, uh, over the next three weeks. And then I'll introduce our main speakers and, and their topic for today. So it gives me a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. El Hamid El Magamed, our executive director, to say a few words. Good morning, everyone, and Ramadan Karim. Um, I want to welcome you to the uh, HBKU lecture series on COVID-19. And um, I want to stress the importance of artificial intelligence and big data uh, Today, as the virtual world and the physical world become more and more intertwined, uh, um, uh, the use of AI and big data analytics uh, are even uh, more so important. As we also face an information explosion or a pandemic, um, uh, AI and data synthesis and big data handling become also more important. AI is also has have uh, played a big role in the medical side of things, not only in the data analysis and 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 um, uh, visualization and, and and so on, but also in the medical side, whether it's in drug discovery, whether it is uh, in in uh, 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 testing, whether it is in discovering new vaccines and so on. So truly, we have never seen the physical world and the virtual world become so intertwined like we are now and like we are on the COVID-19. I wish you the best of success and welcome again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thanks very much. So, so before I uh, uh, introduce, uh, give a, give a outline of uh, the, the upcoming lectures, I just want to mention some house rules. So essentially when you log in as an attendee, when you enter the, you know, the uh, the virtual room, I guess. So your your microphones are automatically muted, and only the host can unmute them. Uh, but we do encourage you to ask questions by typing them in the Q and A window on your right hand side. Uh, and in fact, we we really encourage that strongly because we really want to make these lectures as interactive as possible. So periodically, as you post your questions, uh, the session chair or host, uh, uh, in this case me, uh, I'll ask the speakers to pause and answer some of the questions. At the end of the talk, uh, the speakers will stay back. And today we have two speakers, they'll come back and they'll take more questions. And at that time we can uh, be, you know, these questions can be voiced uh, after the, you know, unmuting from the host. So, as I mentioned earlier, before I, uh, uh, before I, uh, you know, we dive into today's lecture, I want to give um, an outline of all the lectures that are coming up. I'll just take a few minutes to do that. 
just to set the stage and just to uh, just to give you uh, this you know an idea of the spectrum of topics that we'll be covering so as i mentioned today it'll be on data visualization and exploration uh, and i'll come to that a bit later uh, next on on thursday uh, there will be a lecture on meta review of COVID-19 literature by Dr. Murad Ozani and Hossam Hamadi. Uh, what they'll show is how to carry out a systematic review of the COVID-19 research literature. Now, there's been a lot of work that is currently being published every day. Lots of papers are appearing. And the question is, how do we make sense of it? And what, uh, what will be shown on, the, on Thursday is basically how to carry what's called a systematic review, which can be thought of as like a research about research. For example, suppose your question is, is there published evidence that hydroxychloroquine has been effectively used for other diseases, other diseases besides malaria? Then we can use this tool called RYAN, which QCR has developed over years and which has many thousands of users, tens of thousands of users worldwide. How that tool can be used to efficiently do screening and answer this question, or help answer this question. Uh, on May 4th, uh, uh, Dr. Faisal Farooq, who leads uh, QCRI's uh, Center for Precision Medicine, will explain how AI can be used to streamline health services during a pandemic. You know, when experts talk about flattening the curve, the primary reason is to slow down and not necessarily eliminate the number of new cases in order to prevent the health services from being overwhelmed. But, can, but uh, can we use AI to efficiently make health services more efficient and, uh, and, and more effective and thus increase capacity? So this is a question that Dr. Farooq will, uh, will talk about and how AI techniques can be used to do more data-driven scheduling and more data-driven driven analysis. Uh, now, uh, on May um, 7th, uh, the focus will be on epidemiological modeling, because, you know, the uppermost question uh, on everybody's mind is when will this, you know, COVID-19 end? When will RIFE return to normal? So uh, there are lots of mathematical models out there, and Dr. Saad and Dr. Rizzo will lead the lecture on how uh, these models are constructed, what are the assumptions that they make, all mathematical models make assumptions, what are the assumptions how true are these assumptions to what we're observing uh, in, the, in the real world? And moving on, on May 11th, uh, as Dr. Ahmed mentioned, uh, AI is not just being used for data analysis, but it's being used uh, in, uh, you know, to design new vaccines, to discover new drugs. And, uh, and, and Dr. Raghwendra and Asan, uh, Dr. Asan Ola will lead the, a team of uh, you know, scientists uh, to help us answer this question, can we, can we use AI to efficiently narrow down the uh, co possible drugs or combination of drugs which may be effective against COVID-19? Uh, you know, the world, uh, the world Health Organization has uh, coined a term called infodemic to describe the information overload that has accompanied the pandemic. An important question that arises is how how to trust the information and, and that we receive from various online platforms and media channels. And we have three world experts in QCRI who will help us wade through the infodemic on, on May 14th. And finally, on, uh, on May 18th, we will um, have a panel. All the, of, 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 uh, of some of the people who, are, who have given the lectures, they'll come together and, and uh, help ask questions. And that panel will be on May 18th, and that'll conclude the series of lectures. So uh, hopefully, you know, this will, uh, you know, uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us for all the lectures. Uh, and uh, now I want to sort of switch to uh, today's uh, presentation. So today's presentation is on data visualization and exploration of COVID-19 data. And uh, it will we'll be given by Dr. Nan Tang, who's a senior scientist at QCRI and an expert in the area of visualization and data management. In fact, his data, his visualization dashboard is currently being used in, in, uh, you know, internationally. Uh, 
Dr. Amin Sadegi is a scientist at QCRI and he has uh, ex expertise in machine learning and computer vision. And between the two of them, they will uh, give this lecture. So the rough outline for today is that Dr. Tang will speak for uh, anywhere between 30 and 35 minutes. I hope you ask questions so we can, you know, that time is a bit, we have some flexibility. After that, Dr. Tang will take questions. Uh, again, as I mentioned, please post your questions on the Q&A window, and I'll take a subset of those questions and then ask Dr. Tang to answer, try to answer them. That will be also the time of transition to Dr. Amin Sadegi, who will again speak for the same amount of time, 30, 35 minutes. And after that, uh, both of them will come together to uh, answer your questions. Again, I, I cannot emphasize uh, that please ask, ask questions, please put your questions in, uh, in the Q&A box. And uh, so with that, uh, over to Dr. Nan Tang to introduce uh, the, the, first, uh, uh, the first lecture. And I'm gonna, sh uh, please share your screen, Nan. Hello. So you see me and hear me well? Hello? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, okay, so can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Not yet? Okay, let me... Oh, no, I think I'm... Here. Note, oh... This is coming up. No, uh, it's so the let me, when you can... yeah, now it's there. Yes, okay, okay, I'll start. So, thanks everyone for attending the first lecture series. So, my name is I'm a scientist from QCRI. Today, we are going to talk about how to use visualization and exploration for COVID 19 together with Dr. Amin. So in this lecture, we have two parts, and I will um, talk about the first part that for three questions. The first one is, what do we stand today in history about COVID-19? The second uh, question I'm trying to answer is, how does it affect Qatar? And the third question is about, can we try what we see from the data realization? And, uh, and uh, Amin will take the part two, and he will also try to answer three questions. First is, why did COVID-19 grow so fast? The second is how to control the pandemic. The third one is how to calculate mortality rate. So let's start by the first question. I think everyone will care a lot about where do we stand today. So uh, this is an infographics about the history of pandemics. So basically it shows how the, it's the most deadly um, pandemics in history. So if you see the, the timelines from almost 2000 years ago to now, and from the left, you can see the names of the different plagues, epidemics, and the pandemics. So there's a number about death toll. So somehow the size uh, indicate the death toll. So if you see a bigger size, it means many people died because of that epidemics. Okay. Now let's just try to see what kind of interesting uh, insight you can get from these infographics. So first is when you see this, you can many of them we didn't see anymore now nowadays, but still. St Many remain, for example, the yellow fever and HIV, IDS, and also um, Ebola. So many still exist. If you look at carefully about the last 20 to 70 years, so this happened much more often than in the history, right? Because in the history, you can see that the um, virus happened, let's say, 10 times, but now it's happened much more often. I think the main reason, or maybe the part of the reason is because the, um, I mean, so the people are so easy to travel to different places of the world, and uh, it's very easy to have the interaction between uh, humans, animals, and also the entire ecosystem. So this speed, speed up the, the epidemics. Uh, and also, if you look at uh, these uh, epidemics, many have changed the history of human being. For example, the, the Black Death and also the 17th century Great Plagues, so they changed the, the, the history of Europe. Now, if you look at the COVID-19 at the bottom, it, I mean, so it's although looks very small now, but it already changed the history of our lives. And for sure, it will last for a while, right? So, uh, 
for example, so what has been changed by COVID-19? So in our lifetimes, we have never seen something like COVID-19 that changed so many things, like uh, um, the living style, because we have never uh, kept social distancing like what we are doing now, and also studying style. Most of the studies uh, go online. So for the kids, uh, they have never seen this before, and the economy, and for many things. So even we know what has happened, for example, the, the test number, I think, uh, till this morning is 206K. Uh, but I mean, we can imagine this is still growing. So this can part answer, partly answer about where do we stand because we know what has happened, right? So in order to answer the question about where do we stand, we need also need to know what will happen next. So for that, we need some kind of estimation. So assume now we are at the end of, uh, April, right? So this the 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 dash the right lines kind of estimation about what will happen. Basically, it says that the number will until a peak and it will go down, and it's very hard to predict. So basically, um, people will do optimistic estimation, which is these lines. So hopefully, in, a, in two weeks or three weeks, we can go to the peak and go down, and it's like, likely to happen. Another kind of estimation is pessimistic estimation. So this will go up uh, much faster for a longer time until it can reach the So because this kind of two uh, optimistic and the pessimistic estimations, the real case should be in the middle. But the question is whether that's really do we, do we stand uh, today? So there's another. Uh, um, and can I stop you from like, there was a question sure. about uh, what is the Y axis? Uh, this one? Yeah. This one, this one, basically, why this one? Yeah, the one. This one? Yeah. Uh, so the y axis on, on, the, on the right is a time axis. That's, this means from 2000 years ago and to today. So this is no, about no, the years. I guess it's assuming for this, uh, this graph, the, the next one. Second slide, the, the slide where you're showing the curve, the curve. Yeah, this one. So basically, curve. I mean, so um, the y axis could be confirmed numbers. So basically, let's say the confirmed numbers will grow, or active numbers could grow until you reach a peak and they will go down. So, so basically, it's a number of active cases or confirmed cases when works in estimation. So uh, then, if you think that the, the the case will go up until the peak and it will go down, and it might not be the truth because if you see what happened in history. So on the left, this is the three waves for the 1918 pandemics. On the right is another uh, figure about H1A1 waves. So both of them shows that there are three waves. And uh, typically the first wave is much smaller compared with the second and the third waves. And uh, it will last for one year or two years, depends on, I mean, how things will happen. So, so then in that case, if you see the curves we have now, as we are still growing in different countries, and uh, most likely we are not even hit the peak of the first wave for COVID-19. That means um, most likely what will happen in the future that we are going to, hopefully in, uh, in one month or two months, we're going to reach the peak of the first wave and we're going to experience, uh, experience the second or third waves. And I think this kind of uh, discussion about where do we stand for COVID-19, but if we think more generally about, so where do we stand for um, pandemics? Uh, this is a TED talk given by Bill Gates in, in 2015. Uh, basically, at that time, he the, the main thing in the, in the talk is for the next outbreak, we are not ready yet. So there are two uh, interesting messages I got from his talk. The first is he asked a question about, so, uh, if something kills more than 10 million people in the next few decades, what is more likely uh, between infectious virus and a wall? The answer is infectious virus, at what we can guess. And I think kind of we agree. The second is how much do we really investigate in weapons compared with, uh, let's say, global public systems for stopping a pandemic, a pandemic uh, epidemic? Um, I think the answer is also clear that most countries they invest more money on weapons than medical systems and the, the 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 bad thing is not the system doesn't work 
His answer is, is no such system exists for stopping uh, epidemic. That means we are not ready um, for such epidemic or pandemic. So now let's try to wrap up about, uh, so where do we stand today? So we know in the past, we have seen like around 30 million people infected and more than 206K people died for COVID-19. And the present, uh, our situation is hopefully very close to the peak of the first wave. And for the future, I think um, it just will build a more effective system for epi epidemics. The reason is, um, for sure, COVID-19 will not be the last outbreak, and we know more will come. And this is not a maybe, it's a must, it's a given. So we must be uh, better prepared for that to happen. So next uh, question I'm trying Nas, to ask uh, is Now a quick question. Uh, what is the uh, sort of the time between the peaks? The peaks? Is, there, is there some uh, um, so, information uh, about that? Will it happen? So if, the next six months, I mean, sorry. Right. So if we look at the, these two pictures, so first one, I mean, so uh, for the 1918 is several months, it's from July to October, basically we slow down uh, until we kind of stop and three, four months, we'll go up again, the second wave. If like, the second one for the H1N1 is similar, I think in a couple months, this will go up. Yeah. So it's not like a year. I mean, so if you think about the years, and there's a seasonal, it can come every year, similar to many other epidemics. But for this kind of pandemics, I think uh, the three waves, that means it happens in um, one year or two years and continuously. Okay, let's Thank move you. to uh, uh, move the next uh, question, how does affect Qatar? Because I think many attendees uh, come from Qatar. So the more thing we care is, um, so what is Qatar situation? Um, we call this as two general questions. I'm just trying to make um, a very specific point that about uh, what the effect of locking down policies of Qatar. So I think so we all know that it's super important to keep social distance. And um, the reason or the, the study showed that so if you keep social distance, uh, or you reduce like contacts because of social distance, you can affect less people. So basically, this uh, chart will show that. So if you keep normal a normal behavior, so how many people one person can infect in thirty days? And the answer is surprisingly four hundred people. If you don't keep any social distance, the, the second is if you if you reduce fifty percent of the contacts um, by keeping good social distance, then after one month, this one can only affect um, fifteen people. And if you further reduce to 70% less of contacts, then this will only uh, affect 2.5 people. So this shows the important about, I mean, so how, to, why we need to keep social distance and also why this important um, strategy to flatten the curve. Um, so now we know this is very important. We know Qatar has different policies about how to keep social distance. Then we want to study using some uh, analytics evaluation to show some uh, information. So uh, early, I think early uh, last month, so Google released some information called COVID-19 Community Mobility Reports. So basically it wants to provide insight into what has changes in response to the policies aimed at combating COVID-19. So in a high level uh, concept, Google wants to release some data to show different countries about reduction of activities um, because of the lockdown policies. Um, so they, they will not release data for right away. I think just for this uh, special period of time, they have the data they anonymize based on Google standard and release to the public and they generate um, a report. So this report is generated by Google for Qatar in uh, April 17. So basically they want to show that for different category of places, for example, the first one is for retail and rec uh, rec recreation. The second the type is grocery and pharmacy, and the third one is parks and so on. So this report shows that for the first type, retail and recreation, the activity reduced um, 69 percent, which is a lot. And for groceries, it reduced 44 percent because people went out less often than what we did before. And for the residential, is 
increase for 21% because I think most people stay more time at home, which is expected. So before I move on, I want to give you some uh, information about how, could, how, how they calculate, how to compare different uh, um, numbers. So basically, when you see the baseline, so this baseline means historical information they collect, and this line means the current information. So the current information is calculated based on two type of information. One is for a certain place, how many people visit that place, and also the length of stay in that place. So if one visit, let's say, um, some shopping mall and stay for a longer time, this number will be large. Um, then what about the baseline? So the baseline is average of information in five weeks. For example, so if today is Monday, this number will be compared with uh, five weeks, uh, five Mondays from ja uh, January 3rd, Six. So five Mondays, the average number calculated in the same way, and they compare today's data with that average number to see the you know, activities. So now the question is: Assume we can data released from Google, and what we can do fine grained uh, analytics within this data. So this data we crowd from Google is public APIs. So everyone can get the data. So basically, the data has uh, many. First one is a place type. So in total, it has six types. The second is place name, such as the shopping mall, city center, mall, Doha, and the Sukhar Baladi. And together with the location, like longitude, and latitude, and hours mean less than 1 p.m. And the, this historical information and the current information are the number that just explain how they calculate it. And by the way, so they normalize the information so you can see a straight line of the baseline. And all these numbers are between 1 to uh, 0 to 100. At the end is <clears throat> the time they collect the data. So if you see from the timestamp, it's every few seconds we collect some tuples from Google API. So now the question is, even this um, data we can do. Uh, I'm going to switch to some demo. Uh, I think it's here. Can you see this uh, browser? Before I Wow, well, I have to make sure you can see the browser. So share my screen. Sanjay, oh, Amina, can you tell me whether you can see the screen clearly? Yes, yes, we can see it. Sorry, yeah, okay. I can see it. Okay, so, so basically, you already see the backend data with a table. And on the left, we have different selection conditions. So, for example, you're interested in a certain date, you can select a different date, and you can select different types. And you, we have six types, as I just explained. And um, so we have a certain hour if you're interested in, let's say, midnight or 1 a.m., 2 a.m. And also, you can select a specific place names to see other information. So, when you do the selections, in the back end, we'll filter some data and plot the, the remaining places on uh, the map. So, you can see this map of Doha. So in this case, uh, what we see is today, April 27 data. The last data stamp uh, is 10 a.m. we got this morning. Um, so groceries. So in total, we have uh, 85 places. So if you see each dog, means one place. If you hover over the place, you can see the name of the place. This is the Saudi hypermarket. So we categorize these points based on four categories. So if uh, the recent or the current the activity compared with historical activity larger than one, we put it at the right because it looks abnormal. So if this is a between uh, seventy percent to two hundred percent, we put as orange dot. If it's between forty percent to seventy percent, we put yellow. The green means below uh, forty percent. Okay. So this is basically explain um, how to read this uh, demo. So now I think I uh, try to use this demo to answer different questions. The first is seeing uh, which places activities. Take that as question one. So if you see for today groceries, you can see these right um, dots, and you can you can hover over to see the um, the information there. So this means this morning, uh, more people went to Monoprix uh, the Pro Qatar than the base baseline. Okay, so. Um, Let's see something more interesting that before, right before Ramadan, which is last Thursday, so 20th, and let's just like these others, right? So what you can see is, um, 
the red dots here. Uh, I think a little bit slow. Okay, no, I just uh, basically this show the information about in April twenty third for the places with whose type is others. Uh, the places that has more traffic or more activities than before. So this place is QDC. If I zoom, see uh, bigger. So basically, it shows that the recent activity is more than 1,000, and the historical is it's only nearly 600. That means people went to QDC before Ramadan. And if less, oh, this is, I think I, this is QDC. Let's go to. I think I did something wrong. I'm not sure the data is updated. Let's move to a little bit uh, earlier date. So, okay, so anyway, this uh, demo showed that you can easily see, I think it's updated. So this is April 20, and you can see people went to QDC. This basically four times more activities than the baselines. And also, this place is IUD. I think it's a military base of the US. Uh, so I think the first question is, we use this one, we can find places have more activities. The second uh, question is, so what time has more activities than Euro? So if I go to see this today, that means with this, this like the type, you can see all the types. And I think you can see uh, many red dots. I think it's quite slow. OK. So this means for the midnight uh, this morning from 0 a.m. to now, there are so many places uh, that's more traffic. I think the main reason is currently people tend to go out, go shopping in the morning, not at night time. So if you look at, uh, the, say, the, the data for yesterday, the information will be different because if you average the information for the entire, uh, there will be much less red dots. That means in total, the activities go down. So this is the information for yesterday. So when you see this, you say, okay, uh, the people are, are trying to use lockdown and uh, keep social distance, don't go out that often, there are less bright dots. Um, but the morning time and to go out more often than before. So the third question we try to see is if we want to see certain historical information for one place. So for example, let's say move to this uh, model pre. So when you do this, uh, this is something more interesting. So I think when you hover off here to add place, the, the line chart here will be changed based on the data just hover to. So there are two information here. One is about the historical information, which is in blue, and the other is the, the, the recent or current uh, traffic within red. So when you hover off this, you can see the difference. I think let's try to go to the first one. Should be easy. Okay, so, so this is the city center mall. We all know people when uh, go there much less often than before. So you can see that the red right one is current um, activities is much less than they had before. Okay. Um, skip the last last chart to explain. But basically, this shows you the demo about using the public available data from Google. So we can build a certain dashboard to have different people to understand what's happening in Qatar. And uh, this might also have decision makers to, to de uh, design different policies. And then I think I'll this one, or maybe keep it open if you have questions. Uh, next one, I'm going to move to some, okay. So yeah, so there are a couple of, actually there are lots of questions. Uh, one is, uh, uh, I'll just pick a few and I can, you know, we can answer some later. Like for example, what activities helped most in combating COVID-19 shown by Google? Sorry, okay. can, can so, I repeat the question? So the question was, what, what activities helping most are helping most in combating COVID-19 shown by Google? So, uh, you know, of all the things that you showed, you know, where, what activities are, uh, you know, people doing, you know, have okay. curtailed the most? Okay. So I try to skip, but then it seems people ask question about this. I will show this one. So if you compare different types of, uh, as they say, different type of places. So we have 
six line here that is that the, the red line is for groceries. That means most people now go to groceries, not to restaurants, not to uh, malls, not to petrol station. So I think the highest activities um, will go to groceries because that's necessary. Let's say let's remove this one. We see the second one is petrol station. I think the main reason is many people need to work. Not all the people are working from home. So the the second some activity people still go to petrol station quite often. This one and this is is basically it's not easy to differentiate between the others because I don't know how to define others. It's defined by Google and the malls and uh, because many shops and malls are closed. So, so I think much less people go to the malls now. And I think if we remove this two, at the bottom, we see two information. I mean, so the, the, the brown one or yellow one is kind of the garment. Uh, this one is, as we know most restaurants are closed, so we cannot see much activities there, which is expected. And if we want to zoom in to certain days, for example, from April, uh, from April, when can I zoom in? Yeah. So you can zoom in the, the to see the more detailed information for the selected day the time. But I think this try to answer the question about how to compare different. I think that uh, pretty well, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I move on to some other information about Qatar. So this is kind of we call it the situation dashboard for Qatar, and uh, it has several information. First, let's see the bar chart on the top left. Oh, on top of this is number of people confirmed, number of people recovered, and the remaining active numbers. So this comparison between six G countries in Bahrain, Kuwait, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. And each bar means uh, the, like, has a, for confirmed case, active case, recovered case, and the death. So see the absolute number of Qatar is in the third, so slightly lower than UAE. If you look at the death rate, let's remove the, the other information. So you see the death rate of, let's say, the death number of Qatar is relatively low. It's just only 10 out of more than 10,000 uh, confirmed people. So if we um, look at this table, the mortality rate uh, is only 0 0.1. That means among um, 1,000 people, only one people die. So I think this is a very low number even in the entire world so this is super low that means Qatar a great thing of of i mean treating the patients um, so let's move to the right to see the the trends of comparing the numbers of uh, gcc countries two have the same information just one is in log scale in linear scale so i think this is to compare the uh, confirmed cases if you see the trend in log scale they have similar trends. You see the more detailed information of the, the concrete numbers, so you can see clearly uh, Qatar. I mean, so the everyone is increasing. Qatar in the third place. Um, I think the main reason of using two charts is when you use different scales, they can give you different insight, give you different information. Okay, so I will not close this one because if you have a question, so I'm going to answer uh, There is a related question about. Uh, you know, Qatar has surpassed Italy uh, in the number of cases per million uh, population, and now ranks second in the world according to, you know, the our world in data website. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I guess that's uh, that's also. I guess it's you know it's clear from the data here. Also, I think we used to have a graph where cases per million in Qatar is quite high, right? Yeah. So I think I didn't have. To explain all the details of this, this table. So, if you look at the, the, this about the CC countries, confirmed case, recovered case, active, death, and also this instance, I think this is a number per 100K people as defined by John Hopkins University. So, we use metric. So, you, you see from here, indeed, Qatar had these numbers. That means among every 10, uh, 100K people, it's more than 350, uh, 70 got infected, that's a, the case. I think the good thing is, I mean, so if people can get treated well, the death rate is very low. I think it's also very important uh, to combine different information to interpret the numbers. So for example, so when you uh, see the data from Italy, right, you have to understand 
that if more people died because of the, the age, people in different ages um, have a different death rate. So I think, I mean, so we, I don't have time to cover all these details. And uh, I think in the, the part two, uh, Dr. Amin will focus on, I think if you remember the question, he's gonna answer otherwise how to calculate the mortality rate. I think he can answer more questions there. Um, Thank you. Yes, okay. So let's move on to the next. So uh, I think that's what one is. Is this one? This one. Okay. So this is very interesting. Uh, can you see the the screen? I assume you can see. So this is the report. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Yes. So yeah, that's good. April, it's an April nice report from MLPH, which is a Minister of Public Health. So for the audience who are not in Qatar, you can consider this as CDC of Qatar. In that day, some numbers because they they not they don't always give the charts, just give this kind of plain text. There are three informations. The first is 86% of affected persons are males and the rest are females. The second information is 90% of those infected among expats are males. The third one is 66.5% of those infected among Qataris are males. We can easily plot the, the pie chart to show the three information. But the thing is, doesn't seem to be very interesting, right? What I'm interested in, or you maybe you're also interested in to find a concrete number. Tell me how many people in expat males get infected, how many people in expat females, and also Qatar males. So if you think about this as four variables, you have A, B, C, D, and you just don't know number, you need you know the, the ratios, the comparisons. Basically, based on the three, uh, information that the MLPH provided, you can have easily have the three equations. But everyone knows you need the, the fourth equation to solve this problem. And luckily, it's very easy to say, if you know the total confirmed number of that day, so A, B, C, D, the, the sum of them is 2,376. I think uh, even, uh, so even my son has school can easily solve the problem. So I think sometimes getting information reported by CDC or different data sources, you can apply very simple mathematics to, to, to drive more inside information that you want. So not only through data realization, but also through basic math or data analytics. So by this, to conclude by what we have seen for how that affect Qatar in terms of lockdown policy, is we have seen a lot of reduced activities and we have seen the low death rate and uh, that Basically, we believe that the restricted policies are effective, especially, I think, recently or last week, Qatar enforced the, the mask rate to wear masks when going shopping. So all this can help Qatar hopefully quickly flatten the curve. And I think the last question I'm trying to answer is, can we trust what we see, right? We have seen, let's move this one. So we have seen the analytics realizations uh, derived from data we collected. Question is whether we can trust them or not. The first, I think, when we make any actions, uh, different evidence, and because a lot of data, for example, so we have mobile data that can be collected from information. So we have the satellite maps. This can tell so where are the people, where do they move to. This are rich information plus many other information. We have science, so that means we have. Uh, the theories of techno uh, theory behind it's not only for data science but also for bioscience. We have many theories we can use, and we have the technologies that means we have people, we have tools, we can put them together. So, this can provide uh, insight that we should trust. But later, I will discuss it's, it's only relative trust, you cannot fully trust, right? The reason is how much do we trust the information we see? Um, for example, from data perspective, the first question is whether the underlying data mean the same thing. Uh, especially, for example, in COVID 19, you question about how many are not tested because you're, in some countries, if you have only simple or mild symptoms, you are not even allowed to be tested. And who can be tested, right? The same question. And third one, what's accuracy of the testing? Because we use different uh, methods of testing. And the first one is whether the use method is standard. And the later I'll show you, actually, this is far from being standard. And also, there are many 
quality problems. If you play with COVID-19 data, you collect data from kind of reliable data sources like the Joe Hopkins University and other data sources. And for sure, you'll find they are not correct. They are far from being complete. There's so many missing values and they are not, not normalized and full of duplicates. So all this uh, make the analysis harder, but um, it's doable. So let's say, for example, the first is why do the underlying data mean the same thing? Typically, when people compare the trends of different countries, this is for death, death toll. I mean, the number of people that are in the world. They draw all these trends or line charts to compare, and that I draw the, the green circle, US, and this circles uh, about European countries like France, Germany, Italy, Spain, and the UK. So if you go deeper, let's say if you do interactive analytics, you can see US has more people that than the other countries. The question is why that this kind of comparison is even fair. So there's a recent news say super difficult to compare these numbers. Uh, internationally across countries. So, for example, it says, uh, says uh, in the US, it has far more people that compare with the other countries. But if you go closer to compare the population, right, the US has 330 million people. But if you put those five countries together, it has roughly 320 million people. So, if you want to have a federal comparison, and then you should put the numbers of those five countries together and compare with the US. And if you do that, then you, you will find out that the kind of the number of people that in those five countries together is more than the US. So you might draw different conclusions. And also uh, questions? I know I think it's uh, uh you know perhaps you could move on. Yeah, yeah I think uh, I'm almost done. So so uh, about the testing, right? Because when people count the the that, that numbers, they use different standards. Like uh, the, all these are from news. The US use uh, probable cases since April 14, and the UK they they only count people from hospital, and uh, in, in Belgium they count people not only in hospital but also outside. It's very hard to have one standard ways of counting the numbers. So I'll skip this one. So basically, uh, try to. The question can we trust what we see? The first is uh, we know it's full of uncertainty about the information we derive from the data. But what is not surrounded by uncertainty cannot be the truth. So we somehow have to, uh, based on the information, even though we know it's not certain, this can help understand the truth. And the true genius has in a cap uh, capacity of evaluating uncertainty. That means not only us as a data scientists, but also the machines or maybe machine learning, deep learning algorithm or solutions, they can help to discover the truth. So I think uh, by this, I will uh, finish my part. Uh, I can answer a question and then uh, yes. next one is Amin will present next, yeah. Oh, great, so while Amin transitions, let me, actually there are lots of questions. Some I'll leave okay. for uh, uh, later, uh, but I mean, one question was, uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about the, how the Google uh, mobility report was created. You know, how was the data collected? That's a recurring question. You want to okay, say so, a few words about uh, it? Yeah, sure. So I think basically that's a Google API. So if you connect the Google API and collect the data, let's say the kinds of data is is publicly available. So I mean, it's, I mean. Uh, so basically, they don't prepare the data like a table you can easily download, but they have API. Yeah, let's say if you want to start to crowd data today and they use that Google API, then you can crowd data from now. And uh, I think what we did is we get the data every hour. And this is a time step up. Every hour, we can get how many data. So basically, two or one or 2,000 tuples we can get from Google. This is only for Qatar. And you, you can also crowd data for the other GCC country the same way, right? Basically, using the Google API, you just give the different country information, you, you can retrieve data corresponding to that country you want to retrieve. But so far, we didn't have any limitation about how many we can crawl because it's Google allowed this to happen. But I don't know if you crawl the data for the entire world, what will happen? Maybe Google will say you cannot do that. Okay. There's another question related to your first part, which is, you know, why do pandemics have multiple waves? why they are not all together in a single wave. Uh, 
Uh, I should point out that, you know, we'll be having a lecture a couple of weeks down the road on the modeling of, uh, and, and, you know, we'll try and answer that question there. But if you want to say a few words, uh, Nan, or uh, you, why do we have multiple waves? Oh, I mean, so this is what I can see, right? So because, I mean, so I'm not expert of answering these kind of questions, but I can give my guess. So basically, if you take, uh, for example, the reason I think we have multiple waves is in, so we don't have the cure, we don't have vaccination, we don't have the uh, the cure for this, this uh, kind of virus. Right. That means although at a certain time it's will go down, but there's a potential to just go up again. And uh, if I, I didn't show some slides because if you know this can mutate very fast, and sometimes the COVID nineteen is totally new. It's novelty to the human beings. I say from last year, let's say, assume last year, it jumped from some animals, say the best, uh, to So at that time, nobody has, uh, nobody can immune to this virus. And you see some study, I think people will show later, many mutations of this virus. That the bioscientists very hard to find the, the cure for this kind of um, virus. That means it can go down for a while, but uh, it can mutate suddenly it spread again. So this, and I think we all read news to, we know that this can stay in human bodies without any uh, symptoms for 14 days, even one month. All these potentials, um, it's, we say it's guaranteed this will happen again, right? For example, so now in China, you see the number of cases every day, a new case every day is like below 30 or 40. China is a huge country still. All, all the schools are still closed and uh, restaurants kind of partially open. So they are very afraid the second wave will come. But somehow we know this will happen again because it's, it's not only for one country, it's a global issue. So yep. you cannot strictly, strict people cannot travel from one place to the other place. And when this happened, it's very hard to test to say this is a totally safe person and this will happen again until we have the cure. Yeah. Great. Yeah, I think there are a few more questions, but we leave them for the end. Uh, but thank you, Nan, very much for this informative talk. And now, so I'm over to Amin, who will uh, answer the three other questions that were brought up in the beginning. So, Amin, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanjay. Thank you so much, Dr. Nan. Uh, thank you very much for your time. So, let me share my screen. Again, you know, please uh, feel free to ask questions and I'll, uh, you know, interject in the middle or I'll, depending on the question, or I'll leave them for the end. So but please go keep typing your questions. It's very nice to see so many questions being asked. Yes, yes. I will be glad to get your questions. Okay, so uh, after uh, Dr. Nan's presentation, I'm going to address three different questions regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. First question is, uh, why did COVID-19 grow so fast? How exceeded everybody's expectation? Uh, the second question is, how to control the pandemic? What are different ways to control the pandemic and how to think about this? And also the last question that I'm going to address is, how to calculate mortality rate? Because there are different, different ways that people calculate mortality rates. So, the first question, why did COVID-19 grow so fast? It's all to, due to the exponential growth, the nature of exponential growth. So there is this old uh, story that if you put one grain of uh, wheat in the first square of a chessboard, and in the second square you put two, and the third square you put four, and then all the way, you go all the way up to the end of the chessboard and in, in each step you put twice as many grains and the pre, as the previous uh, square the number of uh, grains grow very fast and grow exponentially in fact it will grow to this number by the time you reach the end of the chessboard and it is orders of magnitude more grains than humanity has ever produced so the problem it looks very simple but most people have a hard time imagining the rate of this rate of growth. There is another interesting uh, problem that if you are able to fold a paper 
only 45 times you will be able to reach the moon from the Earth. So it's very difficult to uh, hold the paper 45 times. It's usually difficult to hold it more than seven or eight times. But uh, you know, if you're able to make it to hold 45 times, then you will reach the moon. So it's, you know, numbers grow very fast. Another example is bacterial growth, that if you have bacteria that can grow once, I mean, grow twice, uh, once every couple of hours, uh, the mass of the bacteria will grow as big as the uh, observable uni universe in less than a month. So, you know, bacterial growth uh, always exceeds our expectation. Now, COVID-19 uh, behaves similarly. Here we have tried to uh, visualize the growth of COVID-19 cases. This is, uh, this uh, date, it starts from 1st March to, uh, uh, sorry, to end, the end of May. And uh, Y axis is the number of cases, is the total number of cases from day one until today. And, um, you know, this is the curve, which is exponential. So, you know, when you look at this curve, uh, it is not easy to, you know, extrapolate how it's gonna continue in the future. It's not easy to forecast it. You know, you always have doubts that is it gonna, you know, grow as, as slowly, more slowly or faster. Uh, so it's not easy to tell. Uh, it, actually, if you continue the same exponential growth, it is, it, it, you know, it's the number of cases go from less than 1,000 to 10,000 in, than a month. But if you draw the number of cases uh, in logarithmic scale, uh, your curve is a, li a linear curve, it becomes a line. And with a line, you can much more easily extrapolate what's going to happen in the future. Now, here I have indicated that uh, this uh, uh, plot is in logarithmic scale. If you look at it, we have 10 to the 1, and then the distance between 10 to the 1 to 10 to the 2 is the same as 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 3, and then all the way to 10 to the 4. So it's logarithmic in a scale. And if you very easily just continue uh, uh, extrapolating this line, you will be able to predict how the number of cases is going to uh, increase in the future. So. This is one reason that logarithmic scale is helpful to understand uh, exponential growth. Another, uh, I have another example here. Let's say we have two countries. We have a red country, red flag, and we have a green country with a green flag. And when you see the, their number of cases over time, here you may think that uh, the red is, is doing way worse than the green country, and the green country is doing way better than the red country. But in fact, if you draw the curves in the exponential scale, in the, sorry, in the logarithmic scale, uh, then you can easily see that, you know, they are both following a similar path, but the green uh, country with the green uh, flag is actually only about uh, four or three or four weeks uh, uh, behind, just that. And, you know, it will continue uh, with the same rate and it will reach and surpass the uh, red country. So you can observe this easily in the exponential, in the logarithmic scale, but if you look at it in the linear scale, it's not easy to, uh, to predict what's going to happen in the near future. There is another example here. Again, if you look at these two countries, uh, still you may think that they are doing the same, or maybe the red one is doing worse than the green one, if you, if you look at the number of cases. But if you draw uh, the number of cases in, in logarithmic scale, then you can see that even though the green country has fewer number of cases, it has a higher rate of uh, increase. And if you continue extrapolating uh, the two curves, you know, here they both reach 1,000 cases within a month. So, you know, 
uh, logarithmic scale helps us understand uh, exponential functions much better. And then if you continue the two curves in exponential scale, that will also, sorry, in linear scale, the same thing will happen, but it is easier for human's eye to trace uh, how uh, this line is gonna continue in future. Now, exponential uh, growth cannot go forever because at some point we run out of people and if you get everybody infected, then there's no more people to get infected. So at some point it needs to stop. And this is why, uh, you know, we should say that growth factor needs to stop. We define growth factor as follows. Growth factor is the number of new cases today divided by the number of new cases yesterday. So it's basically how many, how much percent more cases we have today comparing to yesterday. This is growth factor. Now, growth factor has a profound effect on the rate of growth. For example, in this slide, we have three different curves. We have three different countries, the red country, the green country, and the blue country. The red country has a growth factor of 1.05. The green one has a growth factor of one, and the blue one, the blue country has a growth factor of 0 0.95. Now, if you look at the red country, the number of cases in the red country explodes. It grows very fast and it goes out of the clouds. The green, the green country has a growth factor of one and the number of cases, the number of daily cases is steady. And the green, if, if you look at the blue curve, the number of cases uh, drop. So, but but the, if you look at growth factor, the difference is, is growth factor is very tiny. It's just 0 0.95 is 1.05, it's just 0 0.1 uh, difference. And that very, very small difference makes a very big uh, change in how uh, the, uh, the pandemic uh, basically spreads. Now, the focus must be to reduce growth factor. Uh, if you look at this plot, this plot is basically shows the number of daily cases and there's a distinction between the number of daily cases and the total number of cases. This is the total number of cases. And uh, if you look at it, in total number of cases, your uh, curves are never decreasing. They are all, always increasing or they stay steady. But in the daily uh, uh, cases, at some point, uh, these curves need to uh, go down. Now, if you look at the, the total number of cases, again, if you have growth factor of 0 0.95, the number of cases will uh, converge to some point and then it will stop. In, in the growth factor uh, equal one, uh, the number of cases uh, grows steadily and linearly. And in growth factor 1.05, the growth factor, sorry, the number of cases, the total number of cases basically diverges and it grows very quickly. Now, um, at some point, growth factor needs to go below zero because otherwise the number of cases will grow exponentially and they will grow more than the population. So at some point, the growth factor needs to go below zero. Now, I made a, a simulation uh, to study this. Let's say we have four different countries, the red, the green, and the blue countries, similar to what we discussed. And let's say we also have a gray country uh, which has a decreasing growth factor. Uh, the growth factor starts from 1.5 in the beginning, let's say the beginning of March, and it uh, ends with uh, 0 0.6 uh, at the end of uh, May. Right. So if you have uh, these three, these four countries, if you wanna uh, uh, calculate the number of daily cases during this period of time, it will look like this. Uh, you know, they, we have seen the uh, red and the green and the blue countries, but the green, but sorry, but the gray country behaves like a, a Gaussian curve. And this is why we see uh, Gaussian curves. Actually, this is the main reason that we see Gaussian uh, basically uh, curves for the number of cases for the daily number of cases. And it's not difficult to explain this. Um, 
Um, basically, our uh, if, if in log scale, the number of daily cases is uh, is a parabola uh, uh, for uh, for the for the gray country, and uh, parabola in the largest in the largest scale uh, is uh, equivalent to Gaussian in linear scale, and the reason for that is because here is the the formula for for Gaussian function. And if you take the logarithm of uh, the two sides, basically the logarithm of y equals a constant uh, plus or minus a, a second degree polynomial. And this is why uh, the logarithm of a Gaussian uh, function is uh, basically a parabola. And that's why if you have, if you have uh, a linear drop in growth rate, uh, the integral of your growth rate is a parabola, and then the log of the integral is a, is a Gaussian function. And this is why we, we observe this Gaussian behavior. And uh, so, if you want to, if you want to draw the total number of cases, uh, the total number of cases looks like a logistic function, and uh, a logistic function. Uh, is basically a function that starts flat and then it increases, it starts flat and then it increases, and then it basically uh, stays flat, uh, becomes flat and stays flat again. This is a logistic uh, function. And if you look at, for example, the total number of cases in China, uh, you know, initially the total number of cases were flat and then it started to grow like a logistic function, and then it basically again it became flat. So that's why it's a logistic function. But the e, but the gradient of this logistic function is uh, uh, is uh, a Gaussian function. And if you look at uh, the number of confirmed new cases and the number of people who are under treatment, both are uh, similar to Gaussian uh, functions. And the growth factor is very important. You know, as I as I showed in the simulation, growth factor determines the future of the pandemic. And you know, we need to basically, if you want to control the pandemic, we need to focus on reducing the growth factor. Now, if you want to think about it more carefully, uh, we need to think about the production number. So, I mean, uh, yes. may I stop you for a minute? Uh, there was a question about growth factor. Uh, it says, uh, uh, how you say it's a growth factor without calculating it using a percentage formula, it, meaning cases yesterday minus cases today divided by cases yesterday times 100. Yes, so that's a good question, actually. This is basically how growth factor is defined, you know? You can, uh, you can uh, reduce this by one, basically say new cases today my, uh, over new cases yesterday minus one, and then everything here, uh, everything in this curve will be decreased by one. Right. But this is the way that growth factor is defined. And, um, you know, uh, I think the reason that it is defined like this is because it is easier to use growth factor like this, because you just, Instead of saying, for example, one plus growth factor to the to the power of ten, you just say growth factor to the power of ten. This is because I think it's easier to use it this way. But it's 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 right. You know, if you if you want to say, uh, you know, it it increases ten percent a day, it means that it is like today you have one point one uh, times more cases than yesterday. And it's the, the question whether you refer to growth factor as 1.1 or 10%. And because it is easier to use 1.1, uh, 1, 1, people define growth factor like this. And there was another question, uh, how many days of data we need to reach the conclusion that we reach the peak of the curve? Uh, you know, uh, that's a good question, actually. That's a more of a statistical uh, question. Uh, you know, it's always hard to tell the future. So it's always hard to tell whether you have reached the peak. For example, in Iran, what happened was 
you know, we had one peak uh, before the new New Year holidays, but uh, you know, and and the peak basically the, the number of cases was actually a few days, but after a couple of days that people went to a New Year vacation, you know, there was another uh, a, a growth again. So it's always difficult to tell if it's peaked or not, but um, you know. A, an indicator and just try to uh, analyze uh, its statistical significance using you know uh, statistical tests and i think that's the way to do it but it's always difficult to tell the future for example the case that uh, you and nan uh, showed uh, at the end of nan's presentation they had three peaks for the spanish flu right so when you see the first peak you cannot even say there's not going to be any more uh, peaks in even the next year so it's it's very hard to tell. So are there other questions? No, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Keep going. So okay. So uh, in order to control the pandemic, we need to control the reproduction number. As I said, uh, reproduction number is defined as follows: If one person is infected, how many new people will this person infect? during the course of uh, the uh, illness, right? The reproduction uh, number, you know, for COVID-19, you know, uh, in the beginning was estimated to be from somewhere from 1.4 to 5.7. And uh, the reproduction number on day zero without any interventions is uh, referred to as R0 or R0. So, if you want it's, it's not quite difficult it's not very difficult to calculate r if you have g uh, as growth factor and d um, the average number of days between somebody getting infected and uh, infecting other people uh, basically we can write a simple formula like this that r equals g to the d because if you if you look at two different generations of uh, infected people the size of the second generation, basically there is six days difference or D days difference between the two generations. And the size of the second generation is G to the D times uh, larger because you have D days to grow uh, G times. Uh, you have you basically grow G, G, uh, G times uh, during uh, D different uh, days. And that's why we can simply, we can very simply uh, estimate our to be g to the d, but actually, you know, there's there are there are, very, there are a lot of subtleties to this, and there are better models. But this is a simple uh, model to uh, estimate. And for example, if you want to estimate r, uh, sorry, estimate r for uh, for uh, China. Actually, this is not Italy. This is China. Uh, so in day zero, the reproduction rate was somewhere about four point eight. Uh, the, in day 45, the reproduction rate was about one. And in day 90, from the beginning of the pandemic, the reproduction, day, the reproduction rate was about 0 0.9. Sorry, about 0 0.5. And then if you see, if you look at it, growth factor above one or below one has a big effect on reproduction. If growth factor is above one, then reproduction rate is also above one. If it is below one, the production rate is also below one. But if uh, a growth factor is like, for example, 1.3, if you have only 30% increase a day, then uh, your reproduction should be somewhere around 4.8. In this, in this example, I assume that the number of days between two generations is about six days. You know, it may be five days, it may be seven days, but just this is for the sake of analysis. Now, if you look at the number of daily cases in China uh, and draw it in a logarithmic scale, it looks like this. It looks similar to a parabola, but it is actually is skewed uh, to the left. And if you uh, you, you know, you can try to uh, interpolate this curve with a bunch of linear 
linear segments, a bunch of linear. Uh, sorry, I mean, there was a question about some clarification. Why, so, why did you choose D, D as six? This is an example or? So actually, it's a very complex question, actually. You know, as I said, I, I don't know the exact number. Nobody knows the exact number, but this is just an estimate. It's complicated because, you know, we have a, a bunch of people who are asymptomatic. You have a bunch of people who have who are pre-symptomatic. They, um, uh, you know, transmit the virus. And as soon as people start to become symptomatic, you know, people will try to, uh, you know, uh, keep distance and they will try to, you know, uh, pay more attention to uh, the hygiene and things like that. So, so, so it's not the case that the most, the most, uh, 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 the more uh, symptoms you have, the more um, uh, you spread the virus. Actually, if people have higher symptoms, they spread uh, the virus less. So it's so this number is a combination of different curves and actually, you know, uh, exponential weights on different days because, you know, the weight for day 10 is different from the weight for day four. If somebody transmits the virus on day four, then because the virus is transmitted so quickly, it has much more time to, to be transmitted to the next person. So it has uh, much uh, more, uh, it's much stronger effect. So, so, so it's, it's complicated and knows that number, but it is estimated to be between five and seven days. This is how it's estimated. So any other questions? No, thank you. Thank you. Please okay. go, go continue. You. So, uh, so uh, you know, if you look at the number of daily cases in China, uh, it looks like the uh, black uh, dashed curve. And then you interpolate this curve uh, with a bunch of uh, linear curve or, or some or whatever else. And, uh, you know, using this, you can try to find a growth factor on uh, different days. For example, in the beginning of the pandemic, the growth factor was higher. Then it started to decrease, then it again started to decrease, and then all the way to below one, right? And then if you have this uh, curve, you can estimate the growth factor like this, that it initially was very high, and then it uh, started to uh, reduce, and then again it reduced, and then at some point in time, maybe uh, in the maybe in the beginning of February the growth factor uh, went below one. And then you also, at the same time, you started observing uh, this decrease in the daily number of cases. And it basically continued uh, slowing down. And uh, right now, you know, actually by the end of, uh, by the mid-March, uh, it basically was consistently below one. And that's why uh, the number of cases was uh, uh, reducing. And then using growth factor, you can estimate the production rates. And, uh, you know, I estimated the production rate for China. Initially, it was four. You know, so this is all estimates, right? It could be slightly different. There is a confidence interval to it. But it started with somewhere around four, and it reduced down to uh, below one. And now it's it's below one, and that's why uh, the pandemic was the, the, the epidemic. And if you draw the daily number of cases in in linear scale, these have this factor and this reduction rate. Uh, our interpolation will look like the blue curve, and the uh, actual numbers will look like the uh, black uh, dash curve. Now, there was actually a day in mid uh, in mid February in China that the Chinese authorities they actually uh, changed the definition of a sick person, an infected person, and a whole a whole lot of new people were qualified as infected, 
and they, they, were, they were added to the statistics on one day. And this doesn't mean that in this day they had uh, so many new cases, actually. They, they, these people were cases who were, uh, who were um, basically who went to a different place. They were not you know, tested positive, but they had symptoms. So they were a different uh, distribution of people. So then we can ignore them in this, in this analysis. Now, if you compute, if you want to visualize the total number of cases, not the daily number of cases, the total number of cases looks like this in logarithmic scale. And here you see the, uh, the new addition to the number of uh, infected people. And here is also the total number of cases in linear case, in linear scale. Now, if you, if you look at it, this curve never decreases because it's a cumulative curve. It's basically the sum of the number of cases from day zero until any day uh, during the time. So it doesn't decrease, uh, but this is actually, this red curve is produced according to the, uh, the reproduction rate that we estimated. Now, reproduction rate is very important. If you want to control the epidemic, the production rate must stay below one. Uh, and for example, this is a simulation where we suddenly introduced uh, 100 cases, 100 infected cases per country. But in that country, the production rate is below one. So what happens is within a month, almost uh, the, everything disappears because the reproduction rate is about 0.9. It's very slightly under one. And uh, so this is, you know, the case where you have a small production rate, but you introduce a, a whole bunch of infected people. There is also this uh, other simulation where R is slightly more than one, is 1.1, but only one infected person is introduced uh, on the same day. So, if you look at it here, you have introduced only one sick, uh, one infected person, but because the production rate is higher, is, is, uh, is above one, the number of cases explodes. But here, even though you have added 100 uh, new cases, 100 cases, let's say from abroad, but the reproduction is, but because the reproduction rate is below one, the, basically the number of cases drop sharply. So this is why what matters is reproduction rate. It doesn't, you know, closing down the borders is really not going to help much in the long run. What matters is uh, bringing down reproduction rate. If closing down the borders help reducing reproduction rate, then it helps. But if it doesn't reproduce, if it doesn't uh, affect reproduction rate, you know, it really doesn't help control the pandemic. So if you look at the production rate in China, it succeeded in controlling the pandemic only after the production rate went below zero, sorry, below one. And, you know, and there is, you know, the, the change between above one to below one is a very, very subtle change. You know, sometimes it may be the case that a very, for example, some testing or closing down, uh, you know, some kind of, It's likely above one to be very, you know, important because, uh, you know, a very small change in the policy will. Infection is controlled. Uh, there are not for different. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a question. Of, uh, um, I mean, there was a question that, that begs the question, how does social distancing um, uh, what is the relationship between social distancing and the uh, reproduction number? Yes, that's a very good question. I'm going to address that slightly later, but you know, you can okay, think of great. a reproduction rate budget. So basically, you can say if everybody stays at home and nobody goes out of home, nobody, uh, reproduction rate, let's say, is zero. And if you open up the schools, reproduction rate is for example, added by 0 0.2, for example. 
if you open up shopping shopping malls, uh, reproduction rate gets added by another 0 0.5, for example. If you if people use masks, reproduction rate is divided by let's say 0 0.8. If uh, you uh, you know if uh, you if people work from home, the production rate is, for example, changed to another uh, degree. You know, if you think about a budget of reproduction rate and your reproduction rate must remain below one, you can put in uh, certain policies to make the production rate stays below one, and uh, you know make sure that you can control the pandemic. But but. You know, going back to uh, your question, uh, you know, there has been some about uh, how social distancing affects the production rate. It certainly reduces the production rate. But the, basically, the amount that it affects the production rate depends on a lot of different factors. And it is not complete, like 100% understood. But for example, it is calculated that, for example, I, I, I'm not, I don't remember exactly, but for example, this, the closure of schools has a certain uh, calculated effect on reproduction rate. Right? People have complete, have calculated this effect using uh, controlled experiments, basically natural experiments that, for example, you compare two different cities within a country uh, and see how uh, the closure of a school, for example, one, one uh, city is a control group, one city is the effect group, and then you compare the change in the production rate according to whether uh, you know, schools are closed or not. So there are ways to compute this, but because it has been going so quickly and there has been very little time to experimentation, it is like completely understood. But it is known that social distancing affects uh, reproduction. Uh, so did I answer the question yeah, properly? You. Okay, great. Okay, so if you can, so you can think of or not for some different diseases, uh, for example, for MERS, uh, R0 is, uh, is less than one. So if, I mean, if you don't do anything, uh, I mean, if you don't uh, really, you know, make uh, so do social distancing, it will die off on its own. Uh, but if you go down, measles, for example, has a very high reproduction rate, it is 15. So if people are not vaccinated, then the reproduction rate for measles is 15 and for chickenpox it's, it's 10 which is big. But uh, if you look at, for example, HIV and COVID-19, they have a comparable or similar uh, reproduction rates, basic reproduction rates. And the question is why, you know, if, if HIV and COVID-19 have similar reproduction rates, why HIV grows so slowly and COVID-19 grows so quickly? And the answer lies in the number of days between, uh, you know, somebody getting infected and infecting other people. In HIV, it takes years for some somebody to infect others, but in uh, COVID-19, it takes uh, merely days, maybe five, six days. And that's what makes uh, uh, HIV uh, different from COVID-19. And that's what, why HIV, sorry, uh, COVID-19 is more serious. So or not is not the only factor that shows the seriousness of, as a, of a disease. You also need to look at the number of days that it takes to transmit the uh, virus. So reproduction rate is everything in pandemics. And if you want to control pandemics, we need to reduce the production rate. Uh, so, you know, one classic way to reduce reproduction rate is vaccination. For example, if 50% of people are vaccinated, the production rate is reduced by half. And the reason is, you know, only half of the people have the opportunity to, uh, to uh, transmit the virus to others because half of people get immune they don't get the virus and they don't transmit the virus to others. So only 50% of the people have the opportunity to, uh, to uh, transmit the virus. So that's why the production rate drops sharply by a factor of 50% if you vaccinate 50%. Now, I have a question. If, for example, R0 for measles is 15 and 95% 90 of people are vaccinated, then how much is R? not difficult to calculate it, 
it means that only 5% of people are unvaccinated. So the number of, uh, so, so sorry, the R not to be multiplied by one by, by 5%. So uh, then this means that R is equal to 0 0.75. So it means that if it, it is enough to vaccinate 95% of the people, basically make sure that you can control measles, you can control the epidemic of measles. Otherwise, if you vaccinate only 90% of people, you cannot control measles because the reproduction rate will be 1.5 and 1.5 is, is big. You know, you remember I, I showed this simulation for a production rate of 1.1 and it exploded. And it exploded. And if your reproduction rate is 1.5, then it will explode very quickly. So, nine, so there is a big difference between vaccinating 90% of people and vaccinating 95% of people. And this is what matters in, in a social distancing. If there are very few people, or maybe let's say 20% of people who don't pay attention to social distancing policies, they ruin everything. And um, so it is important to make sure that uh, everybody is uh, is uh, abiding by the rules. And th this is why uh, countries are taking basically measures to find people because there is a, there's an economic externality. They, uh, they hurt other people. So uh, if you, if you, uh, so if you wanna look at why are decreases over time, one reason is vaccination. Uh, another reason that I discussed, another reason is social distancing. Uh, this slide shows a simulation of how social distancing affects uh, reproduction rates. And in the left, in the left figure uh, here, uh, people don't basically pay attention to social distancing. There's no social distancing policy in place. But in the right figure, people pay attention to social distancing. So a lot of people just stay where they are. And, that, and then when you compare and you simulate, uh, you know, the number of people who get who stay infected is basically very less. And uh, basically, this is the idea behind flattening the curve. Other reasons, other factors that affect R include hygiene. Uh, if you have, if you wear masks and gloves, for example, when you go shopping, it will help reduce R. And, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to study the effects of masks and and uh, gloves, you need to study their effect through their, their effect on uh, reproduction. That's basically how you uh, study the uh, effects of uh, social distance. And then uh, there is also seasonality. Uh, seasonality is basically similar to the, to the Spanish flu, the thing that you showed uh, at the end of uh, Dr. Nan's presentation. And so the reason that, the main reason that uh, we had three uh, peaks in the, uh, in the flu curve was, that, was because of seasonality. So in the winter, reproduction rate increases and it goes over one. And in the summer, the production rate goes below one. And that's why you have this peak in the beginning of winter and then it goes down and then uh, you, you have uh, the same thing next year. There's actually one other reason for that and that is for, for why we have multiple peaks. And that is, uh, like if you look at China and other places, China had one peak and other countries had another peak. Uh, so if you put these two peaks together and don't pay attention to which country that peak is from, basically you see multiple peaks. And this is another reason to see uh, multiple peaks. So going back to uh, how R decreases, another important factor is uh, testing, you know, testing could uh, reduce the production rate because if you test people, if you test people, uh, people who are infected are gonna stay home, and this means that they are gonna be less. Uh, there is gonna be less uh, transmission of disease from infected people to uh, to uh, non-infected. And that's why uh, testing also matters. For example, testing, if testing can re reduce the production rate from 1.2 to 0 0.8, then it's basically the difference between 
uh, you know, uh, explode the explosion of infection or the, uh, basically being able to control the infection. So it could be very important. But there is another last factor that I want to uh, study, and that is herd immunity. Uh, herd immunity is the fact that, uh, you know, if most people, it, it's, back, it's actually similar to vaccination. If most people are vaccinated, uh, then uh, you don't basically get the uh, you get the virus to be able to spread in the population. It's, it's similar to vaccination, but herd immunity comes naturally, uh, and vaccination is a, is an artificial intervention. But herd immunity is natural because people who get infected they uh, uh, they basically uh, cannot infect others because uh, they get immune to the virus. Now. We can, if you are careful, we can look at R for different individuals because not everybody has the same R. For example, there it, it depends on people's um, uh, people profession. Some people who, who interact with a lot of others they could have a higher reproduction rate yeah, because if they get infected, they have interactions with a lot of other people. But some other people could have lower reproduction rate because, again, because, for example, they stay home all the time. Uh, so different people have different. What we observe as a global reproduction rate is basically the average, is the mean of that distribution. Here in this figure, in the right, we have people with higher reproduction rates. And in the left, we have people with lower reproduction rates. And it, it may be the case that most of people, most people have a reproduction rate of about one, but there are a bunch of super spreaders who, for example, go to, uh, you know, crowded places because of their profession, profession or for other reasons, uh, that actually those uh, super spreaders are responsible for most of the spread. And but what, one good news is that people who have higher reproduction rate, they tend to get the disease uh, faster than others, earlier than others. Because they have more interactions with other people, they have a higher likelihood to get the uh, disease early on. So early on, we see a huge explosion in the number of cases, but these people get, they get the disease and then get, they get immune. And because they get immune, uh, more people from the right of this spectrum, the right of this distribution, uh, uh, basically uh, uh, are removed from uh, this pool than the people from the left distribution. So if for, if, for example, you have, if you have this distribution, the next day, or maybe the next week or two weeks later, you have fewer people on the right side. So the mean, so the mean of this distribution uh, decreases uh, quite significantly. And then if you, if you continue this, more people from the right side get infected and get immune. So basically you can uh, reduce, so, so basically reproduction rate naturally drops uh, because uh, just people get uh, immune. And uh, actually, I think this is, a, this is a very big reason in how uh, the pandemic was controlled in China or in other places. I mean, can you uh, wrap up now? I think because then we can take some more questions from people. Yes, sure. So the last thing that I wanted to discuss was how to how to calculate mortality rate. Basically, um, uh, mortality rate is the number of people who died over the number of people who were infect infected. But it is not as simple as this. It's not so simple uh, because there are a lot of uh, questions. For example, if you divide the number of people uh, today over the number of, uh, sorry, the number of people who died today over the number of people who were infected today, uh, it doesn't work because a lot of, because uh, the, the people who were infected today are going to die, you know, in two weeks. And people who have died today, they have been infected two weeks ago. So if you divide these two numbers, you will not get a correct estimate. You will actually underestimate a uh, mortality rate. So you need to have a number. So another version is to, to divide the number of people who died today over the number of people who recovered today. But this also doesn't work. And uh, if you have, 
So maybe it is better to divide the number of people who died today over the number of people who were infected 14 days ago, because it takes 14 days for people to die. Or this number could be 12. So it's not, it's not clear how to exactly calculate mortality rate according to the data. Uh, so what, what happens here is that we need to have the number of people who were infected today and will die over the number of people who were infected today. So basically, the percentage of the among all the people who were infected today, how much percent are going to die? But the problem is we don't know who is going to die and how much, how many people are going to die. So it's it's complicated. So the way to so, so this is basically the standard maturity problem. The number of uh, the number of deaths is not mature today. You need to wait for maybe a month or, or several weeks to basically get a mature estimate of the number of deaths. So in order to fix this problem, we can use cohort analysis. But it's, it's very simple. What you do is you divide people into different cohorts or different time groups. For example, 14, there were, let's say we can say there were 797 people who were infected. Among these people, uh, one person died on day zero, two people died on day one, uh, one person died on day three, and all the way. And if you, if you arrange uh, your statistics like this, then you can compute the probability of death on the day zero after being diagnosed, or on the day one after being diagnosed, uh, or all the way to the uh, end. And then you can take the average of different, uh, uh, basically, statistics from different cohorts. And then when you take the average, it will give you a, a, a basic and more accurate statistics about how many people are, are likely to die a, a, any day after the infection. And then you can take the average. So it picked up some of these numbers to calculate the accurate uh, mortality rate. Another last factor that I want to discuss is that you know, when we talk about mortality rates, it's important to, to pay attention to whether we are computing mortality rate given whether a person is tested positive or given uh, antibody is present or given uh, a person have symptoms or given a person is infected or a given a person is exposed to the virus. These probabilities have, they, they are vastly different. For example, the second uh, mortality rate is actually maybe 10 or 50 times, or maybe in some places 100 times larger than the first estimate. Sorry, uh, sorry smaller than the first estimate. Or uh, if you want to calculate the probability of mortality given somebody has symptoms or not, this could be another factor of two. So it is important to be careful about one what version of mortality rate we are uh, estimating and, and what version of mortality rate we are using to analyze the, the, basically the, uh, the statistics. So I think I can wrap up with this and I am happy to get your questions. Great, thank you very much. Actually, there are lots of questions. So let's start from uh, the last one I got. For mortality rate, how about the number of deaths divided by number of deaths plus number of recovered? Is that a valid measure? So you set the number of deaths over the number of deaths divided, sorry, the number of deaths over? The number of deaths plus number of recovered. Okay, yes, that's a good uh, thing to discuss. Actually, I brought this in my, uh, in my presentation. This is the middle uh, uh, line. So actually, this is not entirely accurate because the, the time it takes for somebody to die after getting infected is different from the time it takes somebody to recover. For example, it may be the case that the people who die, it takes, for example, 14 days, but the people who recover on average, it takes seven days. So this, this, these two time frames could be different. And if if the time frames are different, which is certainly the case, you will get affected by this uh, maturity problem and you will get biased by the maturity problem. Yes. 
Uh, so another question was, uh, do you have growth or reproduction rates mapped for Qatar? How much would this curve change if Qatar implemented lockdown measures even for two weeks? Uh, if it uh, if it did implements, uh, yeah, implements lockdown measures even like I'm assuming that he's he uh, they want to ask like complete lockdown measures for two weeks. Yes, so, yes, yes. That's a good question. So you know, um, see, for example, if if you look at the reproduction rates. If reproduction rate is four, for example, you know, lockdown measures could be possibly, for example, bringing this down to two. So still, it is way more than one. Yes. Uh, but if the, if the reproduction rate is one point five and you divide it by two by a factor of two, it will go below one. So it depends on whether reproduction rate is above one or I mean, significantly above one, maybe four, three, or four or slightly above one, um, you know, I cannot tell that what's going to happen, what would have happened if Qatar had, you know, this other policy in place, because it's a, it's a completely a, a unfalsifiable uh, question, and I cannot basically, uh, you know, prove anything on what would happen if otherwise uh, policies were in place. But, you know, probably what would have happened was the uh, reproduction rate for a, for a period of time would decrease and maybe we had a, a basically smaller uh, reduction in the number of cases but then because this effect of um, this effect of herd immunity would kick in uh, uh, slower we would see essentially the number of infected people the same number of infected people maybe uh, delayed by a few days so i mean my point is I'm not sure whether it would make a lot of difference, but you know, it's an unfalsifiable question and I cannot give you an accurate answer. Yeah, I think there are a few questions related to, uh, I, I guess would say South Korea, because there are reports that people who are recovering are getting reinfected again. So, uh, so there was a question about how will this be modeled or will vaccinations really help here? Do you have some general thoughts about that? Yes. So we okay. have, you know, we have always anecdotes and and we have statistics. So there is definitely anecdotes that uh, you know, if people uh, get infected, chance that they can get infected again. You can always find cases that they get infected multiple times, right? Uh, but in terms of statistics, you know, I'm not an expert epidemiologist. But I have studied uh, papers that say, you know, people who have been infected, they show a good deal of immunity. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's a question that needs, you know, I, I think a doctor needs to, a medical doctor needs to answer. So, uh, is Nan around? There's a question for Nan, I would say there's... Uh... I'm here. So, I, I guess uh, this question is about more about the Google API. So it says, is the data retrieval from Google API the same way as from Twitter? Uh, is it open to everyone or only for affiliated organizations? Do you know about that? The data we can. Yeah. No, I think, no, I think the, the answer is, so this crowd by QCRI through public uh, Google APIs, that means everyone who knows how to write code to call a Google API can get the data. And then the next question is why can we can release the data? Because I think it's possible, but I cannot make a call to say we can release now. Uh, okay. But uh, but people can access it from through the Google API. I think that's a good good answer. Yeah. Yes. And it's, it's a public data. So if you know how to get Google, Google allows you to do do that. Yes. And uh, yeah, I think that's uh, I think that's a good summary of the questions. Uh, uh, any any final thoughts, Amin or Nan? Uh, for example, you know, uh, the question that came to my mind was, you know, like, I mean, you mentioned about these different versions of mortality rate, right? And there's so much, con potentially so much confusion. How uh, are, uh, you know, countries and global organizations, you know, how, how, do, how are they trying to declutter in some sense, you know? They have to take actions uh, based on these mortality rate, reproduction number, 
and and the you know the information is not clear yes uh, yes yes that's actually that's a very uh, you know that's a very important i think uh, question it's also very controversial so initially so, so we have we have conflicting uh, results from different data sources for example if you if you get the people who were tested positive with the virus and you compute mortality rate for that that is that number is about maybe five percent or three percent uh, and this is what initially reported by the chinese authority i think something about two percent initially and later three four percent and a lot of so so a mortality rate of three percent is a huge deal that you know if you wanna if you're gonna lose three percent of the population it's gonna you know put a very economic a huge economic burden and on the society so that was that implication was huge but then there was this uh, unfortunate natural experiment with the uh, with this uh, cruise ship with the diamond princess, princess cruise ship that even though the people uh, they, they had a median age of 58 or sorry 68 years uh, only two people among the 2000 people who were present in the uh, in the cruise ship uh, died initially and then later i think seven ten people died. Uh, so the mortality rate and uh, apparently about four uh, seven hundred people were tested the mortality rate was maybe one percent or maybe even less than one percent maybe half a percent and now within the past couple of weeks people around the world have tested people with antibodies and they have figured out that apparently more people have antibodies that than ever people expected so maybe 50, 50 times more people have antibodies so these, we have to take these uh, results with a grain of salt because um uh, because uh, you know you know there is a specific problem and you know we're not 100 percent sure yet but these tests are painting a completely different picture these tests say mortality rate is maybe zero three percent and you know whether mortality rate is zero point three percent or whether it is three percent it has a huge implication on you know what what are the right policies and whether you know how how should you do in the trade-off how should you do between the trade-off of uh, economy and people's lives you know so it's, it's it's still controversial and have established uh, their uh, narr narrative uh, yet in some countries i uh, think that the mortality rate is three percent and they are taking uh, this these lockdown measures quite significantly but there are other countries who estimate this to be much less and they are basically opening up their uh, countries. And I think this is, this is gonna still be ongoing. And uh, I think, you know, within a couple of months, uh, it will be clear that, uh, you know, maybe one of these uh, is gonna be the case. But uh, now I cannot say for sure, you know, uh, what is the right uh, statistics. So uh, now the question was, I mean, it's not exactly the same question, but you could, uh, maybe this could be the last one. Uh, what about the John Hopkins data? How reliable is the John Hopkins data? No, I think it should treat it from different um, perspectives. So I think first, if you question is how accurate is the data? For example, so what's the real number for different cases, like active case, confirmed cases? For sure. I mean, so because this this number is collected from different countries, from different CDCs, from WHO, from different places. And uh, each data source is not accurate for sure. But the thing is, uh, that's the, the most reliable data sources we know for now. So basically what we can do is we can try to infer, if we take, take Italy, for example, right? So they say, we know how many people died in this city. And uh, the mayor in the city say, we know that's it's four more people died at home, but it's not counted. Right? So the, the data itself is not accurate, but based on information, we can somehow infer based on different cases about the numbers in different countries. Um, as I had mentioned in the, I have mentioned in the slides, um, you cannot fully trust the data because it's full of uncertainties in, I mean, so from many different dimensions, but again, so this can give you the evidence 
uh, to guide you about making an, any decisions because without this information, you can't make any decision. So um, I think this is kind of the answer to the question. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I just I think uh, maybe one last question and then we'll stop, uh, which was again related to your three peaks that you showed earlier. I guess I guess people are curious, and I'm not sure what the right answer is, but still, will COVID-19 have a similar pattern to HIV-1 and 1918 flu? Is it the pattern a property of the pandemic or the property of the specific virus? Or So you ask me or you ask now? Yeah. Any between the two of you, any you could answer that, yeah. Now you want to go ahead? No, I think um, I, I can just shortly answer the question first. Uh, because I think it depends on how you interpret the three waves. So as you already show, or you already talked in your I mean, presentation, if we globally, right, we already uh, saw different waves from different countries. Let's say China has the first wave, and if we overlap the waves from different countries, but I think that's not the real question. The question is that for one country, for one place, whether you can see the three waves, because that's people care more about what will happen in the future. And uh, so, uh, let's say if we make the assumption that we couldn't have the cure or vaccination uh, in one year or uh, 18 months as uh, estimated by the different countries, then I think uh, most likely we, we, we should have the second wave. But then the question is how we should um, for the second wave. And also, as I mentioned at the very beginning, that for sure this is not the last uh, pandemics in the coming few so it doesn't matter whether we have the second wave for COVID-19, we must um, invest more um, money or whatever efforts of building this global uh, health system. But you can take from there. And, and you can just add on, there was a question, did SARS and MERS have a second wave or do we know or? Um, I think no, right? Basically, if I remember correctly for SARS, uh, it's mainly in China, Hong Kong, and uh, mostly in Middle East. So we, we, I mean, so we live in that age. So we, we, we didn't realize they have different waves, right? Just uh, last for a couple of months and just disappeared. And yeah. I can also give you a quick explanation. Uh, you know, I think uh, it, it has to do, so, so there are two factors here. First, overlaying the statistics from different countries. If you overlay, for example, the statistics from China, uh, you know, with other places, you see two peaks because one peak is attributed to China and one other peak is attributed to other places. And this may have been the case in Spanish flu, uh, partly. Uh, but the other effect is, you know, seasonality matters a lot. And, uh, you know, if there is seasonality, if, see, if, if this immunity comes from herd immunity, then there is not going to be a second wave. And because in, in herd immunity, you will have a reproduction rate like this uh, that is decreasing over time, and then it's not going to increase again. But if the immunity comes from, uh, um, it, if it comes from seasonal issues, seasonal changes, or it, if it comes from only policies, then it could have a second wave. And I think, you know, I think what will happen, my, this is my uh, guess, uh, that what will happen is, countries, different countries, when they open up, they will see another peak. And then after that peak, uh, we will reach some kind of herd immunity and then, uh, you know, it will stop from COVID until it uh, mutates again and, you know, uh, it becomes another strain, a different strain. Great. It is. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. And I hope, well, thank you very much for, you know, taking so much time to prepare these two lectures. And also, you know, thank you, the audience, for uh, attending. And uh, don't forget that there is uh, another talk on Thursday, same time, 10 to 12. Uh, and I hope you have registered and hope to see you then. Uh, so thanks again and uh, have a good day. Bye-bye.